The following podcast contains alcohol-enhanced conversations about alcohol, as well as a potential for discussions about other topics of dubious, disturbing, possibly offensive, but usually hilarious interest. The opinions stated herein are solely of the person stating them, and any endorsement of these opinions by any other party is not implied. Foul language is likely, but intolerant viewpoints are not. Listener intoxication is advised. Hello and welcome to the second Whiskey Tangent Podcast. I'm Scott. I'm Ed. This is Ed. In keeping with our last podcast in which we had two ryes, today we have two bourbons. And Ed is going to describe which bourbons we have. All right, we're going to have have, uh, Basil Hayden, which is a personal favorite of Scott and I. And uh, an interesting choice, I think, to many would would be the old granddad bonded 100 proof. And we'll tell you why we have them. Uh, There's a a background to each. And... uh, I don't feel like talking my whiskey right now. What's going on, Scott? You seem, Scott seems a little distracted today. You came a little with a little bit of an attitude. What's going on? Um, Something happened on the train home from work? <laughs> uh, no, actually. Um, in, in uh, Nobody molested you today? No, not today. No, that would be a good thing, actually. So that's probably inappropriate. Yeah, in a I'm place. not making fun of people who are molested. No, start we're, over. We're we got to start, no, start no, over. No, no, we're fine. We already started four times. <laughs> Such a lie. <laughs> Three times? Twice. Twice. <laughs> okay. Three times. <laughs> oh, God. So in uh, just researching podcasts in general, because, again, this is our second podcast, if you couldn't tell by the unprofessionalism that's been uh, happening already. But, but cuteness. We are adorable. Um, <laughs> the uh, In researching it, I came upon an article who uh, the guy had listened to a podcast of two people who believe that the earth is flat. <laughs> God and damn it. Yeah, and he was the, the the writer who was listening to this podcast was he did make clear at the beginning that he does not believe the earth is flat, but he thought that the podcasters were so charismatic that he was starting to believe in some of the things that they were saying. Like, oh, NASA would say that, you know, that kind of stuff. Which if you believe that the earth is flat, then you just have a fundamental misunderstanding of all science. I mean, gravity and observations, just because you go outside and you think you can't see the curve of the earth from where you're standing does not mean that the earth is not curved. It's such an issue. I actually have met people that have told me that the earth is flat and that it's ringed by the polar, the ice. There's no really ice caps. It's just like. Yeah, yeah. Antarctica is just a ring. Right. And North North Pole are just a big square rectangle, whatever ring. It's so absurd that, but you know, I I should be used to it because I talk to adults who seem to be intelligent and then they say something. And it could be about anything. It could be about politics. It could be about religion. It could be about crime. Or, and it just makes me stop and go like, wow, like you seem like you're so educated. I know you're educated. You've gone to college. Do you just avoid learning? Is it like you, you pick and choose what you want to know? You know what it is? It's, it's, it's ignorance mixed with arrogance. Like they wow, don't, so true. they don't know anything <laughs> about the subject, but they're so arrogant to think that only they actually do know the truth. And it's a vast conspiracy by governments and scientists and NASA. A conspiracy to do what? Let's say the Earth was flat. And (laughs) and NASA and the government and all scientists everywhere were were saying that, no, no, it's round. Uh, To – for what purpose? Galileo said it. Galileo said it 400 plus years ago, right? And, so and start, what, like, Galileo so, starts the conspiracy, and we all say, "Hey, that's a that's a good that's well, a good conspiracy." Well, see, let's, let's do keep that. It, let's keep yeah. it going. Let's, let's do that. That's, going. that's fun. Like they ignore the fact that like boats can like sail around Antarctica, you know, because uh, they think Antarctica is a an ice wall that's keeping all the oceans from falling off the flat Earth. Or that our planes actually go over the North Pole to like get to Asia. And, stuff I, like. and, and if you ask them questions like, "Well, how does night and day work?" Because if the sun is above, then the entire Earth is in daylight. And if the sun goes beneath the flat Earth, 
sun is round, by the way, like everything else in the universe. <laughs> we know the moon is round. We can see the moon is we sitting can see right the there. The moon is it's round. round. Uh, and Mars is round, and so is Jupiter and Saturn, and uh, you know every and other star that we can see in the sky. Didn't their parents ever buy them a mobile of the solar system? <laughs> Quite clearly, the third planet which we live on is round. Uh, yeah. Let's get a mobile. I, don't I, I forget. I forget what I was. Th- I'm so I'm so angry that I forget what was my What's point. A- was. What I'm angry? Oh, n- night. So the the sun is beneath the flat Earth now. So we're all dark. But no, it, it, Earth is not dark. The entire. In other words, what he's saying is if you call Australia right now, I'm so angry. It's it's not. It's just so you know, it's nine o'clock in, at night our time right now while we're doing this this uh, podcast. If we call Australia right now, they're going to be like, "Hey, what's up?" No, nah, but they're in on it. Hey, it's hey, daylight. Hey, they'll say, "Hey, good morning," and then we'll, <laughs> right. and we're like, "Oh, oh, is it?" No, but it will be there. It'll be good morning there. The sun's up in Australia right now. I would think, right? I would think so. It's got to be 12 hours ahead of us. Mm-hmm. I mean, Amsterdam is six hours ahead of us. So you figure, right. so it's, if you call them and be like, hey, what is it? It's daylight. Well, that means that, that, that they're alone, in on it too. That, right, that everybody in Australia is in on the flat earth conspiracy right now. I mean, it just never ends. Like, it doesn't. I mean, you, you tell them that the, the classic thing was, uh, which is how a lot of people discovered a lot of laymen discovered that the earth was round was when ships would sail off into the distance the bottoms of the ships would disappear below the horizon before the before the mast right. did. And vice versa, when one was coming towards you, the mast would appear first. Right. Now, that could only happen if the Earth was curved. Right. And Unless if it was flat, you would just see the ship sail into the distance until your eyesight couldn't see it anymore. I, I hope you're not explaining this to me. No, I feel I'm, like not. <laughs> I'm not. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it's just, it's, it's right. people who don't, want to look at any evidence and same thing for me my pet peeve and I'll, I'll i'll pack this one together with the flat earth because it's just as bad is the moon landings are fake oh uh, we never landed on the moon oh for crying out loud now that drives me crazy for a number of reasons first of all because the people who are saying it that we didn't land on the moon they have absolutely no evidence that we didn't land on the moon they just think it sounds good to say the government would probably lie about that. So think about that. Their only evidence is, well, I can, I believe that that's something that our government would lie about. Now, if some of them I've heard uh, get slightly scientific by saying there are no stars in the background mm-hmm. in any of the photos. Mm-hmm. But the reason why there's no stars in the background is because the foreground is so bright. But you can't even reason with them at that point. Because, real again, quick. it's ir- ignorance and arrogance. Why are the planets round again? Can you tell us the scientific real quick without what? boring the audience? What, why? What now? Why are the planets round? What makes them round? Oh, uh, the gravity. Over a certain mass, the gravity will pull the material into the, the most efficient shape possible. And that most efficient shape is a sphere. Because from the center of a sphere, everything is equal in all directions. And to say that only Earth, among all the planets and moons and other things of sufficient size, are round but the Earth, is a ludicrous proposition. And they they can't even prove it. They just want to be right. Right. Well, most people don't realize that there wasn't just one moon landing. All right. There were three? Four? No, there was actually more than that. I wish I could find it, but... Well, the Apollo mission, so was, a, was it 11 right. uh, was the first one? Well, 24 one? astronauts actually traveled to the moon. Three had made the trip twice. And 12, 12 different Americans have walked on the surface. Have they? Have they, Ed? Right. So here's the funny part of that. So like the whole famous movie, what, what was it? Apollo 13, right? The movie with uh, Tom, uh, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. Where, where they didn't get there. Where they didn't get there. So we actually faked a moon landing that failed. Right, so that's that's how that's how deeply they were ingrained. They spent millions of dollars to send a rocket to not go to the moon. Right. So right. people actually think there was only one moon landing, and they think, oh, we faked it. Well, there was one. The reason you see the pictures of the first moon landing because it was a pretty big deal. It was the first. Yeah, it was 1969. It was July. Yep, July 20th, 21st. They landed on the Sea of Tranquility. They were my heroes. I had a poster of the astronauts growing up when I was like nine, ten years old. I. According to my mother, um, took my first steps on the very moment that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. I stood up and started walking because I was not quite one. I was mm, ten months. The reality is, so we we nine, actually faked, nine months. We actually faked six additional moon landings. Six moon landings and one failure. Right, and one failure. Yeah. 
Well, just to make it, you know, just to make it legit. <laughs> and, and You have to fake one that fails. And so here... Here's the one piece of evidence that I'll give to anybody out there that still thinks, well, they could have faked it. <laughs> With no evidence, by the way, just because just that sentence there, well, you know. I it's can, possible. I can see them doing it. that. I can yeah. totally see them doing that. Hey, listen, let's say I agree with you. I can totally see our government faking it. We were in a huge race for space with the Soviet Union. It was a hot competition. They got to space first with Sputnik, and we battled to see who could outdo the other. The way I know that the moon landings were not faked, one simple point is that the Russians would never have let us say that we land on the moon if we didn't actually land on the moon. Yeah, that's probably the best. That's the best that's one. The they best hated point. the fact that we got to the moon. And if they have radar, they have telescopes, they watched us do all that. If we hadn't actually done it, they would have been like, bullshit, you didn't do it. And let me tell you something right now. England and and in London, we're watching us. You know, the, in, they were in London. They have a big observatory there. They were watching. They're our friends. But you know, your friend does something. You know, you'd be like, hey, man, you're my boy. But you didn't dunk that you basketball. You did not dunk the basketball. <laughs> I, you're telling people you dunked. I watched it, bro. You didn't dunk. So if we didn't get on the moon, and, and rather not get on the moon, they would have been like, you know, you didn't get on the moon. <laughs> Come on now. We're not letting you get away with that. So uh, you can feel what you want. There's no evidence to support that we faked it. At all. No one's ever come, no, no 80 year old, 90 year old man was like, I was a camera tech. And there was nothing that's come out. It just sounds good. And, and it's, and it's the same thing the flat earthers do. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that means NASA, all the astronauts, I mean, it all fits in. That's why I brought up because like that means that all the people that orbit, all the satellites that are orbiting our planet, taking pictures. Google Earth comes up, it brings the whole Earth up. You can flip it around and zoom right in on the Earth. It's like, it's crazy how much technology we have that they just continue to be ignorant. Like, they seek out and live in ignorance. It's unbelievable to me. And now, Basil Hayden. So, yeah. the bourbon. Yeah. Now, maybe we should talk about whiskey. That was our tangent. Yeah, one, well, well, one of them. Yeah, one of them. So, Basil Hayden has, uh, uh, we, you know, we and Scott have a different journey to get to, to our, our, our whiskey uh, heritage, if you will. I drank a lot of Jim Beam and Jack Daniels when I was in college and in my 20s because I really didn't know any better. I didn't have the budget for anything better. And uh, and, and I mixed, you know, Jim Beam is a delicious I, bourbon and ginger. I drank a lot of Labatt's. That tells you how poor I was in college. Drank mice, I had a tower of Meisterbrow in my dorm room. Meisterbrow? Yeah, from the beer distributors in Pennsylvania. Wow. Once again, we're based in the outside of Philadelphia oh, I and forgot South about Jersey. Meisterbrow. In case you're wondering where, where we are based in the... Uh, Burlington County, out right outside. We're going to mention that every time. We're Jersey boys. Because we also want to put people onto some of the great places around here. True, right. If you're in the area. Menu, yeah, you know? absolutely. You know, if you're within a half hour. Yeah, half hour from, from uh, Burlington, Medford, mm -hmm. Cherry Hill area, Burlington. Because uh, good whiskey bars are not easy to find. And uh, if we if we find a good one, we'll let you know where it is. I was in the whiskey lounge that uh, Scott and I belonged to this last night and Still talk, haven't been there. Talk to me like Sorry. That. He's a member there. He just never gets over there. But <laughs> we will. We just joined it recently. It's a new, it's, it just opened. Yeah, it's only a couple, it's only been a couple of weeks. I've been a little hard on myself. Right. Yeah. But. Because um, I'm sad. Because I want to go. Right. We were going to go tonight, but then we knew the podcast would never happen. Right. Because we would be <laughs> stuck over there. Because we have a, uh, in our locker, we have a bottle of uh, Angels and We Ride, which is one of our favorites. And uh, Red Breast Tenure? 12 Year. 12 Year. Oh, yeah. 12 Year. Which I'm not sure I've ever had. No. Me, it's an Irish my, whiskey. Right. right. Which is yeah. funny. And when I was over there the other night, just last night, and uh, and somebody else has a locker, and I'm talking to them, and we're, you know, shooting the shit a little bit. And I try to, like, you know, throw my whiskey penis on the table and i go hey i got a, a bottle of a uh, red breast 12 year in there and uh i go which locker is yours he goes oh mine's a locker whatever and i look over at it he's got a 15 year red breast right in the front oh, no. and i was like oh shit i feel like he like he put like a bigger penis on the table like, a bigger whiskey penis like <laughs> he, he oh did. i got a 15 year like i didn't even know they he make did. 15 he goes yeah yeah they yeah do. sorry i only have a 12 and then he laughed he goes i win he actually said i win <laughs> i laughed right? did he oh yeah. that's awesome and then we drank funny. and then we drank more whiskey sure was, of that course was great. that is good so um Anyway, what are we talking about? Well, started, How you got into it? Right, when I started drinking Gentleman Jack, I thought I'd really made a step up in the world. Like, oh, I'm really fancy. So, like, as I said, a lot of – if you're if you're at a wedding, Jim Beam and ginger ale goes best. Jack and Coke is, of course, a classic, iconic wedding drink. And um, we kind of branched off into 
better stuff. We started looking like, hey, I want to. I have a couple of dollars in my pocket now. You know, I, I, I'm working. <laughs> Let me see what else is out there. And you bump into some people who are a little bit older, and everybody wanted me to be a scotch drinker. And they always said, oh, when you turn 35, you like scotch. And yeah, we're a little late to the 35 year yeah. age range for the scotch, right? I, but I mean, they tell me that well, when you're after th- when you're over I have a feeling maybe like 65 for us. Yeah, like maybe like maybe in my IV on my deathbed, I'm like, oh my god, McCallum, <laughs> so good. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality is. Um, we did it's like a deathbed conversion for whatever reason, bourbon. So we went into bourbon first and, um, it's more accessible. It's sweeter. I mean, it's, right. it, it's easier going down. Yeah. Uh, and there's no way, question about that. Right. And like I said, we're talking about the rubbers. We do like Irish whiskey, which I believe is a gateway whiskey to scotch, <laughs> but we're not there yet. So Basil Hayden, uh, it's been a favorite for a long time. And the first time I was exposed to it, I was out somewhere and we were drinking. I think somebody had a bottle of Baker's, which I'd never had before. And I, I don't remember I, if I cared for it or not. I've, I've only had it that one night. I've never gone back to have it again. We probably should. But it's actually hard we to We should, because I'm, I'm not sure I've had Baker's or Booker's, my right. sister or brother. Right. Even. So what happened was on the Baker's brother. bottle, there was a, a neck tag of... Four bourbons, Baker's, which I was drinking, Basil Hayden, Knob Creek, and Booker's. And they all were marketed as small batch bourbons. They were completely different with Basil Hayden being at the 80 proof and then Knob Creek being 100 proof. Baker's, I honestly don't remember what it was. I know it was eight, seven years. Booker's was nine years. Basil Hayden was eight. I'm sorry, Knob Creek was nine years. Basil Hayden was eight. And I forget what Booker's was. Booker's was 121 to 130 proof. Like, I'm like, you guys don't even know. Like, what are you doing? That's insane. Like, and like, it's like a, yeah. almost like, like nitroglycerin. Like, it's so unstable. Yeah. Like, it just the proof changes. And, they, and Booker's you have, comes, to, you have to ship it in hazardous material containers. Right. A Booker's is a great presentation piece to give to someone, but you don't want to. If you're a brand new bourbon, right? It comes drinker, in that. It comes in that really nice box, box and the, yeah, yeah, it's great for the, the garage to put and screws and in and stuff. And the it's got a little a little slide thing. Yeah, it's a little slide thing, right? And so I don't have a house anymore. No, we yeah, first time. Well, Scott are both divorced, but anyway, <laughs> um, it's a long story. It's a long, expensive, painful story. <laughs> Two stories, in fact. Two stories. Anyway, this is a really long intro to Basil Hayden, which. Is completely different than the other three. I, I didn't and even give mine yet. The other three is a what? <laughs> he said I didn't even give mine yet. My intro to Basil Hayden. Oh right. Yeah, that's fine. Right. So Basil Hayden is uh, completely different than the other three: Knob Creek Bakers and Bookers. And uh, Scott, tell us the difference in the in the uh, in the mash content. Yeah. In researching this, I'm not really familiar with Bookers or Bakers. And Ed's going to open. Yeah. Pour yourself another. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not familiar with Booker's or Baker's, but I am familiar with Knob Creek. Uh, and we will have probably another sure, podcast. Sure. Knob Creek has a whole bunch that they've come up with. Yeah. Uh, in any case, the three, Booker's, Baker's, and Knob Creek, have the same mash bill, which is a low rye, high corn bourbon. Uh, whereas Basil Hayden is different. And it's uh, a high rye bourbon. Um, I think the rye content is 27% for Basil Hayden and 13%. For the other three. Right. It's a big difference. Yeah. yeah so it's a big difference. And so, we were drinking a Redemption Rye, uh, a high, high rye bourbon recently. It was 35 or 36%. That's pretty high. Yeah. So that is pretty 26 high, is yeah. still pretty high for rye content. So how I came to Basil Hayden was uh, I had, there was a whiskey tasting pretty early on, maybe eight or nine years ago. And Basil Hayden won. Uh, I hadn't had it before. Uh, I, I did like it during the tasting. And it became my go-to bourbon for a few years until I, you know. Moved on to other. But in researching this podcast, because we both sort of, I don't know, just by accident, by coincidence, decided that we wanted to do Basil Hayden. We were texting each other. It's like, so, yeah, well, which one what, do you want to do? do? And I, I'm you were like, Basil Hayden. I was like, dude, that's what I was thinking. What's nice about a good drinkable bourbon is you don't leave it. It just becomes part of the family, you know? Well, Butch Reserve, for many years, was my favorite. Scotch was basil. So we drank a lot of that together. Yeah. And basil is is one of my favorites. And, and maybe it's maybe I, it surpassed Woodford in my in my in my catalog, if you will. Yeah. I don't know. But that's the fun we'll thing. We'll probably do a podcast on Woodford as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Woodford has a wonderful history and deserves to, to be explored. Uh, their double oaked is excellent. They have a rise well. Yeah. And, and the, the thing is, Basil Hayden started out by just the one signature bourbon. But now they have, they have the, oh, man, the dark yeah. rye. They, they have a dark rye which I think is, is, is that the one that's uh, aged, uh, uh, sorry, finished in the port wine? Yeah, it's fresh. very good. So, and Knob Creek has like a maple one, which is, I still haven't got And they have a the regular maple. rye and, and a... And Knob Creek's got to a single barrel. I actually had the maple recently. And I, because I just 
saw Knob Creek. Right. And I was like, okay, I'll have some Knob Creek. I didn't know it was the Mabel. Right. What'd which I should have because I wasn't What'd paying attention. When I started tasting, I was like, well, the, wow, this like is, different. gosh, this is so sweet. I mean, almost like, like immediately pancakes. Right, right. Like, what is going on here? And then, then I realized I was drinking the Mabel. And I was like, well, uh, of course, right. that's with the maple. Was it so drinkable? It, was it like- oh, it was very drinkable, oh, right. but it was a little too sweet. It's almost like a hoppy beer, right. uh, a, a beer that's overly hopped. You're like, I'm good for one, right? and right, then you right. don't want another one. You want something else. So totally I had the Knob Creek. It was a little too sweet to drink two in a row, um, but it was fine. Uh, I was actually surprised that I was drinking it. Right, so, so in the research for the Basil Hayden, we found out, that uh, Basil Hayden uh, and the other three, Booker's, Baker's, and Knob Creek, all made by the Beam, Suntory, Jim Beam, that is. Right. Suntory Company. The Jim Beam family. We'll Jim just Beam stick family. for that. And, and, and that, that it had surprised this, us a little bit. And, and, and previously mentioned that Basil Hayden had a different mash bill than the other three, but it has the same mash bill as Old Granddad. Mm, made, also made by the same distillery. Which, is in, which was incredible to me because a long time ago, the first bourbon I ever had was Old Granddad, <laughs> and it was terrible, terrible. Now, again, I wasn't a whiskey drinker back then. Right, you this had is no going palate. Back, you had no zero palate. I mean, my early twenties. Uh, Seagram Which is Seven, actually worse because yeah, Seagram Seven is the you only, had no palate, so it shouldn't yeah, have been that bad. That's true, but it was terrible. And it, but the significant thing that it did to me was it turned me off of bourbon for about a decade. Right, that he drank only daiquiris. <laughs> And wine coolers. And wine coolers. <laughs> Sun Country wine cooler. One time I drank an entire one liter bottle of Sun Country wine cooler. Really, an entire one liter is bottle. Is that a real story? Yeah, it's a real story. Oh, In college, shit. and I didn't have a hangover. I must have eaten three cheesesteaks before. I that. don't know. That's I don't know. like a headache waiting to happen. Yeah, I don't know how. And it was like a dark one. It was like a purple. I don't know. Purple Sun <laughs> Country. I don't know what, it, what they were made of. It was stupid. That's like the time. I, my first time I was like. Uh, not first time, but I was at an open bar and I was like, oh, I'll just drink Grand Meunier because it's the most expensive thing they had. Is that the orange one? Yeah, the yeah. orange liqueur. It's really good yeah. if yeah. you have one. <laughs> when you have six of them, the headache the next day is epic. You like, you never do it again. You learn a lesson. You seriously had six Grand Meuniers? I did. <laughs> I mean, it was over like two, it was like two two and a half hours, but I mean, I put them down, but I was just like just trying to gouge the money. I was in the mood like, oh, what's the most expensive? I'll have that. And uh, it tasted great doing it because there's there's fire. It's like it's like an eighty proof thing, like Grand Marnier. It's not like a yeah. it's not like you know and <laughs> frangelic or something. But holy crap, man! The headache the next day was you don't forget that. Oh, the so I forgot to mention that the Basil Hayden and the other three Knob Creek Bakers Bookers all came out in ninety two. It was a great marketing um, push, which is where I saw the tag and, and and got me into them. And what's interesting with Jim Beam is that they. I mean, the Jim Beam family started to make bourbon in the in this, it, it, according to their lore as early as 1795. Now that they can say whatever they want, there's no way to track that. Sounds good. The yeah. company that we know, the right. James B. Beam Distilling Company, really started up in 1935, and then after 10 years later, they sold it to Harry Blum. This guy Harry Blum, he bought the company like in 45, and in 68 he sold. He to, sounds really boring. He sold to American Harry Blum. Right, 1968 they sold to American Brands. And then in 87, it got purchased by another company called Natural Distillers. Hi, I'm Harry Blum, <laughs> accountant. <laughs> Policies well, to all the accountants out there. Long story short. <laughs> long story. I'm and sorry. also people named Henry and or Blum. I'll just wait. Till he, when he gets like this, you just have to wait him out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to take a sip of some basil hazel real quick. Good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's delicious. Are you are you ready? Well, no, okay, yeah, I mean, here's the point. Like, you know, there's a little bit of a sour face you put on when you hear that that Jim Beam is actually owned by Beam Suntory, which is a subsidiary of Suntory Beverage, which is actually a Japanese company based in Chicago in America. But there, so you're kind of like, oh my god, is it really like conglomerates are just not fun? They're not sexy. They're not. There's no history to them, especially in a in the bourbon industry where they're uh, right. very. The marketing is very. Old frontier Americana centric, right. and to be right. owned by a Belgian or a Japanese company is uh, kind of a big right. disappointment. And to their credit, the Japanese have been making tremendous strides in whiskey, though, based on their geographical location, they tend to put out whiskeys very similar to Scotland. They do. Because where their whiskey 
uh, market is or industry is in Japan, if you were to draw a straight line around the round planet, you would smack into or, or, or straight across the flat path. Which, however, you want to do it, straight you'd across run right into Scotland. So it's a climate, for, believe it or not, is very similar between the two. But they do make it, they're starting to make very nice whiskeys in Japan. I haven't fallen in love with all of them. But they are starting to try to do some bourbon. So it's Beam Suntry. They are the third largest producer of distilled beverages in the world behind Diageo and Pinover Card. So it's a big company. Say Michters. 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 No, M. Michters. Michters. Okay, you okay. got it. So that's because I can't sl- say that whiskey brand. That's a whole other what's, what's the other one you, you, you had a problem with? Oh, uh, Pappy Van Winkle. I had some bourbon, so I said Patty Van Winkle, <laughs> but it's Pappy Van Winkle. So the point I'm trying to make, what shocked me when I was doing the research, not that a conglomerate had bought Jim Beam and owned it, but the fact that a member of the Jim Beam family has been a master distiller of the company since 1935 up until today. So even though they've sold the company as early as 1945, and again in 68, and it was sold again in 87. Through this whole period of time, a member of the Jim Beam family is the master distiller, except for one period from 1998 to 2007, some guy named Jerry Dalton was the master distiller. But after 2007, up until today, Jim Beam family member, including as, you know, grandsons of the original uh, founder in 1935, great-grandchildren, uh, you know, all related to the original uh, master distiller, which was Joseph L. Beam. And what's similar, while I'm, on the, while I'm on the distillery of it, a rival brewery, a brewery, <laughs> a rival distillery, Heaven, brewery. I, I'm all over the place, nice. Heaven Lord. Hill, which produces Elijah uh Craig, which is one of our mm. favorite places, as well uh, as one of our favorite bourbons to drink. Elijah Craig, we'll talk about that on another day, I'm sure. Uh, they also put out Evan Williams and their own name brand, uh, Heaven Hill Bourbon. They are also, throughout their entire history, have had a Beam family member as their distiller. So oh. if you want history for Basil Hayden, for Jim Beam, for Old Granddad, for Elijah Craig, the Beam family has been distilling spirits consistently since 1935, and possibly, based on their own words, 1795. So even though conglomerates have sunk their evil claws into our delicious bourbon... That doesn't necessarily mean that the bourbon itself is bad. Or that there's not actually history and love going into it from a family that has been producing tremendous spirits. And and, and I'm sorry, basic white label Jim Beam has been the backbone of this country for a long time. I won't sip it on the rocks. I won't. But I'll still throw a can of Canada Dry in there and call it a happy wedding. And speaking of weddings, old granddad is the king of the firehouse wedding, let's be honest. Talk about what you think of the 100 Proof that we brought out. Tell well, why, the 100 and, Proof. And say so, why we did. Tell, tell why we brought it out. So they had to, we discovered that they had the same mash bill. And then uh, there's an 80 Proof expression of old granddad now. Which used uh, to be 86, by the way, until about five years ago. They dropped it down to 80. So same we, as Basil Hayden, which I find interesting. Right. So we briefly considered doing a test for both. But I've had old granddad. And like I said, it was my first bourbon. And I didn't want to revisit it. But I was willing to revisit it at a higher proof, which is the 100 proof, which we have today. An interesting thing about the old granddad, the picture of the dude on the old granddad, old granddad himself, is actually Basil Hayden, (laughs) the man Basil Hayden. So the man that the bourbon Basil Hayden's is named after is on the bottles of old granddad. So we thought this would be a very interesting uh, comparison to make. And I, I don't know. What do you think of like we've had Basil Hayden many times? Yeah, and I had loving it right now. Yeah, uh, and I'm I'm having that as well. Uh, previously to this particular glass, I had the uh, old granddad. Now the old granddad is uh, it's a little darker because uh, and it will be because it's a hundred proof versus eighty proof of the Basil Hayden, and it's a little thicker again because to get the barrel strength alcohol to a particular proof level they just add water so it's necessarily going to thin it out and actually ed is pointing they look very similar in color the old granddad is not that much darker it's not that much darker strangely interesting it looked darker in the glass i admit in comparison i'd say that old granddad is a little sweeter Mm -hmm. the rye character doesn't come out as much as it does in the basil hayden to me the basil hayden does have lighter expressions of the sugars like 
vanilla and caramel. Uh, whereas the, the old granddad has maybe darker stuff. Like I taste a little bit of cherry. I'm not sure if you do. I like to read other reviews because um, I don't feel like my palate is very sophisticated, but sometimes <laughs> they just get ridiculous with their Absolutely. descriptions. I mean, cocoa powder, that's not a thing, is it? Uh, I guess it is, but I can't taste cocoa powder in anything. That's ridiculous. I mean, that's like when he, I pr- smell, he's probably a flat earther. When I smell Basil Hayden, I definitely get a spiciness in my nose off it. Um, you can definitely taste the spice better in Basil Hayden than you can taste. And they're both, uh, right. remember, they're the same exact It says orange Nashville. peel. It says lemon. I don't get uh, any citrus from Basil I don't get Hayden cit- at all. I don't get citrus either. I get Vanilla, a, very, definitely. Vanilla, caramel, cor- and corn. I definitely get yeah. a corn, a sweet yeah. corn flavor to it. Absolutely. I'm, I'm all in on that. I don't really taste cinnamon. They say I should. It says offset by a gentle cinnamon i would read one of the reviews how gentle like to the point of not at all <laughs> right right <laughs> like like i imagined it like i imagined the world was flat and it says a nice cinnamon pepperness pepper pepper in this like, like i don't consider cinnamon peppery like to me that's a different well there's two kinds of cinnamon right there's cinnamon that's like the baking spice cinnamon and then there's like a hot with a like, hot like paprika cinnamon. type cinnamon no like like a um i've never heard of that uh, cinnamon yeah like red hots you know, like oh, I know what you mean. Oh, like the candy. Yeah, like candy. Oh, red hot, hot cinnamon. Like okay, like okay. a big red gum. Or oh, like something. fireball. Yes, like which fireball. we will not be doing a podcast on. <laughs> if we do a fireball podcast, we have sold out. Right, and that means it's our one thousandth podcast. <laughs> um, Basil Hayden. Let's talk about it because we like to appeal to people who are inexperienced drinkers, like Scott and I. And, and once again, we've. We've drank very expensive stuff. Like I, I just was drinking uh, two nights ago. There's a, a bourbon company, uh, a bourbon product, I should say, High West, of which part of which actually is made from the NGP product we talked about in the first podcast. Please, yeah, I think we talked about. Go it. back and listen to that if you. I think we talked about some High West stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so High West has come on the scene with a lot of really good products. I mean, we've enjoyed it. I mean, the Double Rye's nice. The Prairie Bourbon. I was getting it for five dollars a drink at a local bar down the street from me. It was delicious. It's thirty-two dollars a bottle in the store. It's it's, it's a very nice drinking uh, bourbon. They have one that's called Midwinter Nights Dram, and they only put out a couple thousand bottles a year. Yeah, and it's they, you can't buy it. You can't order it. If you've bought enough of their product, whether you are a store or a, a bar. Is that the one we had in Atlantic City? Yes. Yeah. In the Iron Room in Atlantic City. Right. If, if, once again, we're going to start giving shout-outs to whiskey places. The Iron Room in Atlantic City is a great whiskey bar. So if you're in Atlantic yeah, they City, a lot of stuff. if you're in Atlantic City and you, you just don't feel like drinking, you know, Jameson at the bar in the casinos. The thing about the Iron Room that was interesting, it's like they didn't have a menu of whiskeys. They said the menu is this dude behind the bar. Right. It was the bartender. Was I the wish I remembered menu. his name because he was amazing. And unlike other bars that are really pretty, like two bottles of each, he had like like five feet of depth into his shelves. Yeah, he reaches he, like whole he just arm. Had hundreds of bottles mashed in there like like a hoarder. And then you tell him what he'd be like, well what do you like? And let's say I want some something to blend. He go, all right, hold on. Yeah he, he would stick his arm in there and he'd come out with something. Uh, he was really good because he would put he, three up he'd be like yeah, try he would, one, which one? He'd he'd give you a choice uh from what you described. He would give you three or four different ones you wanted right. to actually and, have. And my point being it was twenty two dollars for a two ounce pour of midwinter's night dram. And it was delicious and I enjoyed it. Like, this is the best part of the night for me. And they only have a half a bottle left, and that's it for the year. They don't get another bottle. They get one bottle for the year. And the person I was with ordered us another round without asking. I wanted a Manhattan, and they poured me another $22 drink of the Midwinter's Night Dram. And they're like, oh, no, no, it's okay. We'll just put back a bottle. I said, no, that's the world's greatest mistake ever. I'll just spend the extra $10 and get another delicious drink of the Midwinter's Night Dram. And yeah. I sat down, and I drank it. And it was spectacular. It was even better than the first one, and I loved it. Yeah. So I spent forty-four dollars on two drinks. You know what I'd like to do? I'd like to do a comparison between the mid, the Midwinter's Night's Dram, and the Angel's Envy Rye. That would be interesting if we could ever find a bottle to do that with, because I don't even know what the cost of the bottle is. Well, well, we could. Right, that's true because it's even rarer than Angel's Envy Rye. Right, you can't order it. So the uh, we could just order a glass of it. We could, and we have our own, right? We have You're our right. own. We have our own. Right. We we'll can... we'll have to do that at our whiskey lounge, and we'll let you guys know how that goes. Yeah. So um, I'm lost when I was doing. Oh, so the <laughs> point I'm trying to make is, I spent forty four dollars on two drinks, and I loved them. 
And so absolutely go out and treat yourself if you want. But what we also try to talk about on this podcast is when you walk into the liquor store and you, it's, you know, you've, it's Friday, you've got your payday, you're looking for what, what do you want to drink for the weekend? And that's where we're at with the Basil Hayden. It's a spectacular drink. It's a, it's a nice presentation bottle. Scott, describe the bottle for the people, please. So the bottle itself is very nondescript. However, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely identical. Right. Identical to the to the old granddad bottle. Right. That, that that's another thing we noticed. Like the bottles themselves, just the glass bottle is exactly the same. Now the old granddad has a traditional uh, glue label on the front. It's orange with right. the uh, visage of Basil Hayden on it. But the Basil Hayden's bottle has sort of like a a paper vest almost that uh, comes down over the neck, and uh, so it's almost like a sleeveless vest, and it's paper like a like a like a recycled like old timey sort of paper. Around the center of it is a, a sort of a fake wood or like balsa wood belt, and on that riveted into it is a copper belt as well with the letters B and H on the front, and. The ink on the paper has a barrel at the top. It says Basil Hayden's and a little bit about the history. Right. I'm going to read the history to you right now. It's when Basil Hayden Sr. began distilling his smooth bourbon here in 1796, Kentucky was but four years old and George Washington was president. Today, we make Basil Hayden's Kentucky straight bourbon whiskey using the same skill and care that made it favorite among American frontier settlers. So evidently, there was a, they're saying that there was a version of Basil Hayden that was drinkable in the Old West, and I have heard that. Um, yeah, I mean, and uh, in, in my research, that was borne out. So he was, uh, Basil Hayden was a real person, and he was um, creating high rye bourbon recipes as early as 1792. Right. Um, which is almost 200 years. It's exactly 200 years right. before the Jim Beam Company was created. Sorry, before the Basil Hayden's bourbon was Oh, released. yeah, because that's 1992 yeah. is when yes. this version was made. Yeah. Because James Beam, they said he, he began selling barrels of whiskey in 1795. If it's not obvious, I've had a few. Now, <laughs> I remember watching the miniseries on HBO, Deadwood, when... A character came in and ordered a basil hayden. Yes. And that would have been in, in the uh, time period of 1876. So I'm right. assuming. It was Civil War, post Civil War? Yeah. Post Civil War. Right. Yeah. And I'm assuming that if they did that, they had done their research that there was at least some version of basil hayden available in the Old West. Probably not the same recipe, but it makes it fun. See, that's a fun story to tell. Yeah. And it makes I, you feel like, hey, am I drinking the same thing that people in Tuesday Right, because it, it doesn't exactly say that it's the same recipe, mm -hmm. but it does say that it's a high rye recipe. So right. it's similar to what the original Basil Hayden was Correct. creating back in the day. Going back to Deadwood. Yeah. How great of a show was that? It was great. And you know, there's a movie coming out. They're doing a movie with the whole cast. No, yes. get out. It's come, they're doing a reunion movie. It's been wow. about 10 years at least. Yeah, yeah. So what we're thinking about with the, with the Basil Hayden and what we're talking about today is me and Scott could drink a decent amount of whiskey. And today we we have gone way past the halfway mark of the Basil Hayden. Yeah, wow. And at least so probably the, a fifth of the old grand. I think that probably sort of gives away which one we like better. I mean. So we drank half the Basil Hayden, but only uh, we're just, we're about an inch past the neck. On the right. old grand. And the next time we're together, I'm going to encourage Scott to, to we'll, make, we'll make Manhattan out, of, out, yeah. of, out of the old granddad hundred proof. Uh, but when you walk into almost any liquor store, Basil Hayden's going to be an option for you. And it's my suggestion is I got it today for thirty nine ninety five, and it's been on sale. It's had a sales sticker on it at my local liquor store for two and a half years. So I'm assuming that that's the price. But if, if you're paying forty five, forty eight for it, go get Blands. I mean, oh, at that man. point. You're, we should do it one on Blanton's. We will Definitely. eventually. Blanton's yeah. is delicious. I haven't had Blanton's in a very long time, actually. Yeah, because you forget about it. And it's also, yeah. been, there's been a supply and demand issue yeah. for Blanton's. Yeah, there has There been. has been a resurgence of people drinking bourbon. And it's been good and bad. Good in the sense that a lot of new bourbons are hitting the market. Bad in the sense that Basil Hayden, which was traditionally from 1992... Until 2014, always aged eight years. It said it right on the bottle. And if you're not familiar with Blanton's, Blanton's is the bottle that kind of looks like a hand grenade. Um, and it has horses or on top. Octagon or something. Yeah, it has a horse on top. And the horses are different. Yeah, there's a different... There's a, they change poses. There's yeah. a letter uh, for each letter in the word Blanton's. There's a different horse. What does that mean? B. 
B, there's a B horse, an L oh, okay. horse, an A horse, an N. You're an A T. horse. <laughs> I, no, you're an A horse. <laughs> so, <laughs> Basil Hayden used to be eight years aged. Just like Knob Creek was nine, still is. Baker's was seven, and Basil Hayden was eight. And now at the top, it says artfully aged. Which, between you and me, is straight bullshit, all right? No, honestly, straight, I love Basil Hayden. I, I still, I still yeah. think it tastes great. Yeah. But artfully aged, yeah. what, a, what am I? What am I? An asshole? So legally... It's if, at least four years. We yeah, know that. Legally, in order to not have an age statement on your bourbon or whiskey, it has to be aged at least four years. If there's no age statement, you know it's over four years, but you don't know how much over four years. If it's less than four years, they must be an age statement. But my point is... Artfully aged to its fans, and me and Scott are definitely Basil Hayden fans, it's a little bit of slap in the face. If your demand exceeded your supply and you had to start releasing it, you know, like at six, six years, years yeah. seven years, let us know where you're at. Yeah, well, what, yeah, Tell well, us it's seven. Yeah. You know, be a grown up about it. Don't just say uh, artfully aged like it's four and a half years. I think it's the same thing. Did I say that in this version of the podcast? Because we started <laughs> over four times. That's oh. not true. <laughs> Twice. Um, Once, really. Where uh, uh, Maker's yourself. Mark. They're or, drunk, too. Repeat yeah. yourself. If you're not drinking, <laughs> first of all, hold up. If you're not drinking bourbon or whiskey, listen to our podcast. I have to tell you. If you're not drinking, I think you're a flat earther. Unless you're in the car ride home. You can still have one in the car ride home. All right. No, I'm just kidding. That's a fact. No, I know. So uh, the Maker's Mark got in trouble right. when they were running out of product. And they they came up with an idea, and they taste tested it too, mm-hmm. and nobody could taste the difference. So they reduced it. I don't know what Maker's Mark is. It's somewhere over eighty, like maybe maybe it's ninety. I don't even really. Know. I don't think it was like eighty six. And, no. and they and they lowered it to like let's say eighty two, and nobody could taste the difference. But when they came out and said that they were doing this, people went apeshit. They're like, oh, don't water down our whiskey. And what was even more surprising, and probably better for the company Maker's Mark, whoever makes it, um. Mark, right? Some guy named Mark? No, that's probably, it's not making That's Mark. Mark Jennings. That's not true. They were willing to pay more for the same product just because it was rarer and not watered down. And, you know, because if I was Maker's Mark, I might have just done it. Just change the label. Right. And change the proofing on the label and see if anybody noticed it. Because there was a company who did it. Uh, Kraft Mac and Cheese changed their recipe and nobody noticed. They took out all like the uh, artificial ingredients. They just did it. They didn't tell anybody. And then six months later, they had a commercial with Craig Kilborn and then said, hey, we changed the recipe. Ha ha, you didn't notice. (laughs) (laughs) It was like they're trolling their own customers. So the sum of what we're really talking about today is is we want to introduce to me Basil Hayden. If you have never tried it, please definitely go out and get a bottle. It's so worth your time. We're going to say low 40s yeah. at the liquor store. If you can get it in the low 40s, go ahead and buy yeah. it. I, I don't think you're going to be disappointed. 39 to 45, go buy it. If it's if you, if they're trying to sell it to you for 50, there's some better options. Walk past it. And go, we'll tell you what those options are. <laughs> and go are. get a bottle of Bullet Rye for like $35. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. That's the best price. And so this will wrap it up our second podcast. Thanks so much for listening. And uh, here's a whiskey to you. We'll see you next time. If you enjoyed this podcast episode, be sure to check out our next episode, which is way better than this one. Oh, yeah. Also, follow and like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash whiskey tangent. And follow us on Twitter at whiskey tangent. You can follow me personally at that whiskey guy. And follow Scott at giant cup of awesome, spelled A-W-S-U-M, just to be annoying. Hey. You can email us any questions, comments, or love at whiskeytangent at gmail.com. And of course, you can find us always at our podcast website, whiskeytangent.podbean.com.